Please join me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Dr. John J. Gargas. Thank you very much. It's really an honor to have this opportunity to talk to this uh, group about some of the work that we've been doing here and sort of give you my very personalized view on uh, autism, something that I'm sure you hear about all the time and probably is an area of interest for many of you. That's usually the case when I speak in a public meeting. Um, so I, I, this is just an overview of some of the topics that I'm going to go over today. I'm going to start off with a definition and I'm going to run through this list and I'll let you know where I am in the list as we go. Um, I want to start off by explaining my perspective of what autism is, and you're going to probably hear dozens of different perspectives, but this is my perspective. I can only take it in one, in one direction. And that is, uh, and, I, and I think these are non-contentious things that I'm starting off with, uh, it is a very frequent disease. Now we know the frequency is probably around 2%. The best numbers that the CDC uses in that ballpark, one in 66 kids that are born are thought to fall within the autism spectrum. The other distinctive feature is that the frequency of the disease has been rising probably over at least the last two decades. We do not understand why that is. That's what this prevalence curve shows. Uh, we used to think that was just because of ascertainment. We were more aware of the disorder and so we saw it. But I think now everybody pretty much agrees that this is real. This is just not an artifact of ascertainment. The part that's sort of shocking, and every time I see the number, the number gets huger and huger. So I used to have a number here that was a hundred and something billion, I don't remember what it is, but now the paper just came out where the estimated costs per year is $260 billion, and that's just in the USA alone, and that's in 2015. With them calculating the cost in 2025 at $460 billion, and just to put that into perspective, that's bigger than the current US budget deficit and it's bigger than the GDP of all but 10 of the biggest states in the United States. So this is a gigantic social stress. It's a gigantic stress to families and to children and a loss of productivity uh, to the society at large. I believe it's compelling that we can't ignore this. That, that's my perspective on this. Um, the characteristics of the disease is that it's tremendously heterogeneous. It's very difficult to just give you a picture of one kid with autism and say that's what autism is because when you've seen one kid, uh, you've seen one kid. They're all very, very different from one another. But what's happened is the official diagnostic manual, and that's the DSM, has flipped over from DSM-4 to DSM-5, and under DSM-5, um, Everything is now called autism spectrum disorder. There used to be a lot of gradations. People would talk about Asperger, or they'd have a whole variety of other flavors of disorders. That, that's gone. There, there is no more recognition that those gradations exist. You either are on the autism spectrum or you're not. And it's a binary test that's done primarily based on a neurobehavioral assessment. I'll come to that in a second. <clears throat> I think everybody pretty much agrees it's a multifactorial condition. Um, genes are overwhelmingly an important contributor, uh, but it's clear that genes are not the only contributor. There is, a, there is a significant environmental component. I'll come to that in a second. The other part we don't really understand is that boys are affected at least four, four to five times more commonly than girls. We don't know why that is. We have lots of theories about that. Um, but it's, it's unequivocally a, a, a true observation. And so what the disorder is, is it impairs social relationships, language communication, and it's associated with repetitive stereotypical behaviors. Uh, there's, a, there's a clear group, about a third of the kids that have a very characteristic regression where they lose milestones, developmental milestones. They may have a couple of words, they may have up to 10 words, and then they'll lose those somewhere in the 18 to 24 month window. And what we now increasingly recognize is that a lot of the kids develop seizures. They're either cryptic seizures uh, or they're overt seizures, but it's, a, it's not a trivial factor. And we, we believe that it's pathophysiologically connected, that they're mechanistically, autism is mechanistically similar to uh, the kinds of things that happen in seizures. But as I said, this diagnosis is strictly clinical. So we have a research grade 
neuropsychiatric test that will make the diagnosis that we use in our center for making a research diagnosis. But overwhelmingly, most of the children with the diagnosis of autism have strictly a clinical diagnosis rendered by either a clinical psychologist or a, uh, a, developmental, psych uh, a developmental pediatrician or, 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 or a neurologist. The reason is we have no diagnostic tests. There's not something like uh, a gene test. There's not something like a biochemical test. There's not something that you can see under a microscope that a pathologist can tell you that you have the disease or don't have the disease. It strictly has this subjective feel to it that somebody sees the child, they see a constellation of findings, and they render a diagnosis based on that. Uh, that's not ideal. You can't find drugs based on those kind of things. It's a real tough situation to be in. The real reason we're there is because the cause is unknown. And again, that falls back to the problem that there are therefore no treatments for the core uh, disorder. And that's a problem with this increasing frequency. This is just sort of showing the same kind of uh, features that I talked about, but there are a lot of other features that are associated with those core abnormalities. There are a lot of behavioral things like anxiety and impulsivity and aggression uh, that you can see. There are medical comorbidities. There are things that are um, uh, GI related, lots of constipation, feeding problems, vomiting problems. Um, there are immune kind of abnormalities that are associated, some other kinds of markers in brain imaging and so on. And, but importantly, there are a number of genetic markers that have been associated over a variety of years uh, in a variety of different kinds of tests, and that's one of the places we're going to put our focus. So, so th what we know is, as I said, that it's, it's most dependably this complex multigenic disease, many genes. And what does that mean? Well, the multigenic diseases are the diseases that everybody either has or knows somebody who has, because they're extraordinarily common. Everybody has them. Uh, things like diabetes, atherosclerosis, hypertension, the cancers are really the paradigm for these kind of diseases. They're about 10 years more advanced in their understanding that we have here. Nobody anymore just has breast cancer. They'll have HER2 new positive breast cancer. So they have all these genetic marks that have been associated. So they've now taken this wastebasket diagnosis and they've sliced it up into subtypes of diseases. We think that's going to become very, very important for all of these kind of diseases. Oop. Uh, seizures, migraine, uh, autism, a whole host of neuropsychiatric diseases. They all have this kind of a behavior. And what is that behavior? Uh, they have a very high heritability. That tells us that genes are involved. That's what you inherit. You don't inherit anything other than genes. Um, and, and the problem is we now know that too many genes are involved. There are at least 800 solidly linked genes with autism. What that means is that there will be companies who will try to sell you diagnostic panels of gene tests for autism, but it'll be totally useless, totally useless. There's not a chance that anybody's going to be able to look at a genetic sig signature where about 4% of the genes in the human body are affected <clears throat> and tell you what that means for whose genes those are. So there's too many genes to give you a signal that it's never going to be a useful diagnostic. Uh, the, the only kind of pattern that we can see this in these multigenic diseases is a, a situation where identical twins, and again, identical twins means that they are clones of one another. They started off as one embryo and they split, so they're genetically completely identical. Uh, identical twins are much, much, much more alike than fraternal twins, which are no closer than siblings, but they shared all of the womb and all the timing and all that kind of stuff is in common, or siblings. Now, now if twins, the, the other sibs, are still 50 to 100 times higher risk for having autism if they have a brother or sister with autism. It's not exactly the same if it's a brother or a sister, because I told you the risks for boys are higher than for girls. So you have a bigger genetic load if you have a sister that's affected, you have a brother that's affected, you have a lower genetic load. But, but in any case, uh, they're, they're much more alike as identical twins than they are if they're just siblings. But we do have several cases where identical twins will be discordant. And that's to a geneticist says there's an environmental component. We don't know what it is. We have no idea what it could be. 
but the only way that the identical twins can be discordant is if there's something other than genes, and that we're going to call the environment. And, 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 and I think, again, it's going to be important for us to understand the genes to come to a point of understanding the environment. That's why, again, I'm putting a primacy on the genes. What we now recognize, and I would say overwhelmingly the geneticists in all of these disorders are recognizing is that you can't go anywhere with the genes alone. What you have to do is you have to functionalize the gene. You have to understand what the gene is doing if you want to be able to do something with that piece of information. You have to be able to do a functionalization. What is the gene's job? How is it doing things? in order to make it actionable. And this is really the current frontier for all of these, because only when you can do that can you achieve a useful diagnostic that might integrate a whole variety of signals, and can you in, uh, discover a, a therapeutic that might change the course of the disease. So, so that, that was the message that I took forward. When our center got launched, we had the opportunity uh, uh, for there to be a Senate hearing on uh, what we were doing in CART, and that the Senator Correa had, had brought this together. And basically, uh, this is now two years ago, um, we said that there's enough genomic information around on, the, on this disease, on autism, that it was time to at least start trying to functionalize that information and to try to make a stab at beginning to treat uh, the disease. Certainly, the behavioral therapies are very important. For day-to-day, -day, for starting right now, the behavioral therapies are important, but it's clear that they're not sufficient. The epidemic's increasing. They're not bending the curve. They're not changing that, and the costs just keep going up. These are phenomenally expensive ways to treat the kids. Something has to be done to find a way to find new therapeutics for this disorder. So what I said is, and this is still the, the guiding principles that we're working under, is that, that, that the way you would go about doing it, and I use the term cure advisedly, a lot of people jump or wince when I say that, I still think that's the right perspective that we have to take. Uh, you need to start off with the genes. That's the one thing we're really the surest about that is involved, and I don't want to just take statistically associated genes, because I told you those signals are far too weak. I want to take those where we know what the function is that they're carrying out so that we can look at that. Because if we know the function that the genes have damaged, we can look at those genes, and they're going to give us a target to look at how the environmental components are coming in, because they're going to impact in the same process. It's also very important, and again, I, this is something that I went through in, in, when I was talking about some of the migraine things, where people thought, well, why are you talking about the genes in this kind of a disease? Well, again, they give you the targets for developing a diagnostic test. They give you the targets against which you're going to discover the drugs. You're not trying to look for the genes to say, oh, you're at fault for this. It's your genes aren't right. You're trying to do something that's going to let you bend the curve, that's going to let you change the trajectory of the disease. Other thing that's very important is now uh, that we have all kinds of genetic tools, if we, if we know the gene, we can immediately make model organisms. We can make mice. And again, those mice then become very important in the drug discovery and the environmental paradigms. And what's also not obvious is that if we know those kinds of genes, we can refine the diagnosis. Just as I said, we can split things up into type 1, type 2, type 3. You can make a more homogeneous group that you can enroll into your clinical trials, giving you a higher likelihood that the clinical trials will be, select, will be uh, successful. If you have a very contaminated group, a group that's mixed in with all kinds of different disorders, you're probably not going to be able to sort through the kind of weak signals we're able to see in clinical trials. So I'm a metabolic geneticist, and I'm going to give you that perspective. That's the perspective that I bring to this disease, to this disorder. I don't come as a psychologist. I don't come as a developmentalist. I backed into this disorder in a very strange way, and this is how we think about the disease. And it's been a very powerful perspective, and it's a perspective that now is percolating through all of medicine. This is pretty much the way all clinical groups look at disease processes now in a gene-based way. Well, so genes come on human chromosomes. These are the human chromosomes. They don't come in these colors. We're able to image them this way so that you can see the different pairs of chromosomes. You get one from mom and one from dad. If you get an X and a Y, you're a boy. If you got two Xs, you're a girl. That's very straightforward. We can watch. It's very easy to watch the movement of a gene that's on one chromosome. You can see this very characteristic vertical transmission here because you're getting one or the other copy of mom or dad's chromosome, half the kids are going to get 
the abnormal chromosome, the chromosome that carries a mutation. In real families, you can see this very easily, about half the kids in each generation catch the mutated gene. Very easy signal to see. Blue eyes, black hair, very straightforward. But 100 years ago, Gregor Mendel showed that if you just have two genes, this is his very famous P experiment, just having two genes contribute to a phenotype, a feature that you see, gives you this very complicated pattern. Graduate students can do three genes in crosses and follow and see what it looks like, but try to imagine following four or 10 or 100, the signal is very, very difficult. This is very challenging to find the genes that are moving in this kind of a fashion to contribute to the phenotype. One way that many genes come together to contribute to autism is as blocks of chromosomes. And this is something that Dr. Moira Smith uh, and I and a group of us, Pauline Filipek, who sort of started the Autism Center here, uh, were involved in looking at 15, a long time ago, many years ago. This is, an, and it's amazing to just look back at this. This is all we could do back then. We would look at chromosomes just back in 2003. Mind-boggling. So, so we would look and we could see these little extra blocks of chromosomes. We called them marker chromosomes back then. And, and we could tell what, where they were because we were able to tell them all apart from one another by, by, by how they were banded. But we found that kids who had autism and had this unusual chromosome, and it still is the most common chromosomal abnormality in autism. It's a couple of percent of kids who have autism carry this extra block of, of chromosome. That they also had this signature that I'm going to come back to what we call an energy deficiency syndrome. It looks a little bit like a mitochondrial dysfunction, and I'm going to mention that again later on. But we, 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 we could actually see this in the chromosomes. Nowadays, we don't do that anymore. Nobody looks at chromosomes anymore. There's just no reason to ever look at chromosomes anymore. Makes some people wince when I say that, too. But, but, but this is going back, let's say, 10 years. And that's, again, it's amazing to me. Um, uh, this is exactly that same chromosome that I showed you. But here it's stretched out and it's painted with tens of thousands of pieces of DNA from that chromosome are painted on a little computer chip-like thing. We call it a microarray chip. And what we do is we take the DNA from the patient and we stick it to the chip. The important thing about DNA is it's double-stranded and if you melt the DNA, a DNA sequence will find its own matching pair and it'll stick there. So that's how you can do this. It's a very, very simple technologically. And so what you can see here is when I showed you before we were looking at this extra block of DNA here, well, now we're seeing it, each one of the, there's five kids here, five different stripes. So here you're seeing that high dosage. This is what we call a heat map. The hotter colors are higher copy numbers. So we, everybody normally has two copies, one from mom, one from dad. You might wind up with these extra, two extra copies like I showed you in that double minute. These are two different unrelated people who have exactly that same duplication. Here we have somebody who has almost the same thing, but instead of being floating free, they, theirs is still stuck inside the chromosome. So they're, oops, they're halfway there. They have three copies. And interestingly, and this is something that we see in a lot of these copy number variants now, because I'm now using the more modern term, because we're not looking at them anymore. We call them copy number variants is that we see a pathological lesion, a disease-associated lesion, that looks the same whether you have too many copies of the gene or too few. Here are deletions where they're only having one copy. So that's sort of unusual. We don't sort of think about things that way. It, it seems as if the body is built to expect exactly the right dose of these genes in order to build the body appropriately. If you have too much or too little, you wind up, surprisingly, with almost the same problem. And again, this is just taking it up a higher level of magnification, where here, we're actually looking at the single genes that are encompassed by these duplications or deletions. But when we look at single genes, we don't really care about them as chunks of a chromosome. That's not what their job is. They're not marks on a map. They're not those kind of things. But what they are 
is they work together to make proteins that build a team or a pathway. And that pathway, these, this is something you, you probably saw, I don't know, you saw in high school or in college. These are the biochemical pathways that this is what we are. That's what we do. And so, so these genes work together to carry out biochemical processes, to make energy, to synthesize complicated molecules, to break down complicated molecules, to keep us alive and healthy. And for years, we have metabolic geneticists have studied how things happen when you break one of these genes. That's the perspective I bring. We call these inborn errors of metabolism. That's the perspective I wanted to give you on leading into understanding autism. Now, this goes back to one of the grandfather diseases in that class. This is PKU. This is why all the kids get a little heel stick and a blood spot and get sent off to the state lab looking for PKU. And the reason is this disease beautifully shows you the interaction between genes and the environment. Because I'll ask you, is PKU a genetic disease or is it an environmental disease? Well, we know it's a paradigm of a genetic disease. It's autosomal, recessive, inherited, very clear how those spots move through a family. But these two people have exactly the same genetic lesion, and she was treated just by cutting back one of the amino acids in protein, protein steak. She can't eat steak, she eats lettuce, but she's completely normal. Healthy, will have normal kids, no problems, this person is profoundly disabled. And, we, and, and, and when I came here 20 years ago, it was on the cusp where I had some of the first, some of the last patients to be born just before the newborn screening got instituted. So they were severely, severely affected. On the other hand, they were mixed in in our clinic with these kids who were completely normal. So, so is it a genetic disease or an environmental disease? Are they being poisoned? Or, so, so this just puts that into perspective. The genotype, the genes, are a way that you map the environment onto the person. That's how you understand what, what comes out of the, the person. So it gives you the hope that you, if you find the genetic vulnerabilities, you can find the ways to make things better. So that was a simple amino acid deletion, removing an amino acid. This, this is two kids who have the same disease. Again, one of our rare, very rare genetic diseases, methylmalonic acidemia. It was discovered when I was a medical student at Yale, but it, it's, a, it's a disease that is lethal. You're, they, they have to, the kids have to have their blood hemodialyzed. They have to clean their blood of the poison, but give them a very high dose of vitamin B12, and they're completely normal. So, so you can fix these kinds of diseases. Things aren't things that cause severe neurological disorders can be treated. We have a long 30 year for that disease, 30 year trajectory 40 years for PKU. Here's one that we discovered just recently. Um, I had a kid sent to me, they thought he had a, 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 an autistic phenotype and a developmental delay, but also had a lesion that they could see in the brain. I'll show you that in a second. Um, when we worked the kid up, we were able to figure out that he had a genetic lesion in, in this gene, who cares? But what that does, again, this whole thing about the biochemical pathway, how the genes all work together, what it caused him to do is to make his own date rape drug. So that's GHB, and that's what his brain was synthesizing, and that's how he was poisoning himself. And this is what it did to his brain. It caused the basal ganglia in his brain to have the cells as if they were poisoned in a mitochondrial disease and swell. And what, what he was lucky, there were no treatments for this, and it's a progressive and lethal disease, um, but a group had made a mouse model of the same genetic lesion the year earlier, and they found that they could keep the mouse alive first on breast milk, then they looked what was in breast milk that kept them alive, and it was taurine, and they could keep the mice alive on taurine, so I told the kid, eat taurine, and based on the mouse model, we were able to treat him, and the lesion resolved, and now the NIH is having a big clinical trial on this right now. Um, so, so, so can have autism-like phenotypes that we uncover where you can find ways to intervene in these kind of biochemical ways. Now, this was to be the most telling. When this gene find occurred in 04, 
uh, it was clear to me what the mechanism in autism really had to be. And this was a very, very rare lesion that called what's called Timothy syndrome. And it, called, it caused a very characteristic cardiac arrhythmia, an abnormal beat pattern in the heart that could be lethal. It was called a long QT arrhythmia that could set up a fatal heart attack situation if you got out of balance. Where 100% of the kids had the arrhythmia, 80% of them had a full autism diagnosis. They were on the autism spectrum. It's a single gene, it moved just like all those dominant genes that I was showing you, which says mechanistically that the same mechanism that makes the heart arrhythmia is making the nerve, the brain arrhythmia that underlies the autism. And so we started thinking about it from that perspective. It was a very, very suggestive molecule because I'm half a biophysicist and half a geneticist. The biophysicists look at how electricity flows through cells, and this was a very characteristic lesion in one of the calcium channels, and that began to point very strongly towards this being a mechanism that was involved. It wound up being an underpinning for some of the work we did in migraine because the cousin of that calcium, when I say the cousin, we have all kinds of copies of, the, of genes in our body. One's expressed in the nerve, one's expressed in the heart, one's expressed in the brain. Um, uh, was involved in hemiplegic migraine, a very, very rare form of migraine. Migraine is very common. It's more common than autism. It's in about 12% of women. It's, it's, it's not an uncommon disease at all, but, but it's always annotated as a vascular headache. And when we started getting these genes, we've now found three of the genes that are involved in this. They're all ion channel genes. One's a calcium channel, one's a sodium channel, one's a sodium pump. It's not important for this purpose. But the bottom line is they're only expressed in nerve cells. None of them are expressed in blood vessels. So it was sort of crazy to think about why did we think this is a blood vessel disease. Um, it also made it clear why they were similar to seizures, because you could make mutations in those same set of genes. And in some kids who had a mutation in those genes, they had seizures. That was the picture they had. So migraines are like seizures. They're like those arrhythmias. They're like seizures. And it made sense why the seizure drugs were being used off-label. You're not supposed to use them that way, but you can if they're approved drugs. And why they were being used in, in migraine much, much more than they were being used uh, for what they were designed. I never talk about autism without at least mentioning vaccines. I have to do that. I feel I morally have to do that, so I'm doing that here. It seems like I'm disturbing the flow of things. But you need to understand that the, the paper that suggested a link between autism and vaccination is, 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 is no more. It doesn't exist anymore. It was retracted. It's gone. It doesn't appear. It was, it was a horrible study in every way that could be possible. The, 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 the guy who was writing it had commercial conflicts. The people who were involved in the clinical trials were the ones who were suing the lawyers. Um, horrible. So bad that he had to leave England, and he now lives in Texas. Sorry if anybody's here from Texas, but I think that's sort of like an <laughs> ultimate punishment. And so, but, but the, big, the big consequence of this was that the vaccination rates dropped in England dramatically, and they started getting measles epidemics. And measles encephalitis is a horrible, horrible disease, and we're starting to experience the same kinds of things here in California. If you remember the Disneyland event, this whole thing is coming home to roost. So, um, what also happened is that there were a lot of lawsuits claiming damage from vaccination. Now, that's important because vaccine makers didn't want to make vaccines because it was too risky because they could get sued and they're making a little bit. So what the United States did is they formed a vaccine court. So that made the bar very low. If there was even a hint of a suggestion that a vaccine played a role in your injury, it wasn't the drug company you went to, you went to the court and they paid you. It was a, supposed to be like a slam dunk. If you just had a suggestion that the disease was contributed to, because that we knew that some kids did get polio when they got a polio vaccine, that, that really did happen. So, so what happened is, and this is a famous case, um, back in 08, Hannah Poling was the only successful claimant in that vaccine court. So there have been thousands of cases before her, but the claim was made, her dad was a mitochondrial disease doctor, uh, uh, and her mother was a nurse and a lawyer. So uh, they sued 
claiming that the kid had an underlying mitochondrial disease, I'll come to that in a second, uh, and that the vaccination caused her mitochondrial disease to decompensate. She therefore wound up with autism and they won. And then instantly, the next day, 5,000 more lawsuits claiming exactly the same thing hit the court. And the good part of that was that Autism Speaks and the NIH gave UCI a grant to study mitochondrial disease in autism, which is an area we had been studying, because I mentioned going back to that, um, that 15Q inverted duplication. Because there had been clues that there was this component of autism that involved the mitochondria going, going I said, back, back to early 2000s that suggested that maybe there was something there. Um, we sort of have comprehensively looked, looked into that. So I want to flip to looking at autism as an organelle disease. This is a mechanism of disease that's relatively new. And so the first organelle we were looking at was this mitochondrial connection. The ones I'll then touch on are lysosomes. They're these little, um, we think about these as being the furnaces in the cell. The lysosomes we sort of think about as being the stomachs or the digestive parts in the cell. And the endoplasmic reticulum is a little bit like a stress sensor. We didn't have any diseases in the endoplasmic reticulum. What I'm going to try to tell you is we think that autism may be one of the anchor diseases that plays a role in this kind of an organelle disease, endoplasmic reticulum disease. So, so as I said, the first organelle disease I want to go through is mitochondrial disease. We know it causes all kinds of brain diseases. Um, Doug Wallace, who had been here up until a couple of years ago, he's now at Penn, um, had really discovered this whole class of diseases about 15 years ago. I don't know, am I counting wrong? Maybe it's almost 20 years ago now, but it's, but it's, it, it, it's a long time ago. Um, uh, by finding mutations in the mitochondrial DNA. They were able to do this a long time ago because the mitochondrial DNA is teeny. So we didn't have human genome sequence back then, but a little teeny genome like the mitochondria you could sequence. And so they were able to find mutations in the mitochondrial genome uh, way back then uh, that uh, were associated with, with, with disease. And there are dozens, I mean dozens, of mitochondrial diseases. Now it's a very complicated, it's an area in metabolic genetics that I, that I focus in, but, but it, 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 it's very, very heterogeneous. I said autism, very heterogeneous. It's very heterogeneous. It causes a spectrum. We usually could only diagnose it by doing a skin biopsy or a muscle biopsy. You have to study functional tissue, and you have to not look at the tissue, but you have to watch the tissue trying to do its job. You have to watch the organelle, the mitochondria, try to breathe. The only reason we breathe is for our mitochondria. In a laboratory setting, you try to watch the mitochondria breathe and you see what's going on. But it causes this whole array of diseases, seizures, migraines, ataxia, um, uh, that, 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 that cause various clinical manifestations. This is just a cartoon of what they do. I'm not going to talk about it. There's about 1,000 genes that contribute to this function. So there's 1,000 genes that are building this machine. So are you going to assay all those genes? Well, we couldn't do that, but we can watch the thing breathe. So we could carry out a functional assay on the mitochondria to be able to render a diagnosis of a mitochondrial encephalopathy or, an, or mitochondrial encephalomyopathy uh, for, for many years, and that's what we've been doing. In autism, what we were able to observe is the signatures in a group of kids. About 5% of the kids have a signature that looks like these mitochondrial disease signatures, but it's way dialed down. It's nowhere near as fulminant. So we'll see lactic acidosis. Lactic acid is what you do when you're running and you get muscle cramps. That's the lactic acid that's building up. If there's no air, then you're making lactic acid. So as I said, the only reason we breathe is for our mitochondria. If our mitochondria aren't using the oxygen, we're going to build up lactic acid. And there are a couple of other markers, but they're all things that happen in the mitochondria. So we get this biochemical signal. And, 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 and we first, as I said, saw this in these kids with this 15Q chromosomal lesion, these very rare forms. But then we went back in with Pauline Philippic and just looked at all the kids who had come into the clinic. Walk in the door, routine, typical autism. And we saw the same signature, highly enriched, so probability less than one in a thousand that it was by chance, um, enriched in kids who had typical autism. A year later, a group did a survey of all of Portugal, all the kids in Portugal, and they found essentially the same thing. They went further in that they found that none of them had a mutation in the mitochondrial DNA. So it was a functional defect in the mitochondrial energetics 
that was found in this set of about five. They found 7%, we found about 5% of the kids uh, with autism. So the second organelle I mentioned are lysosomes. As I said, they're kind of like the stomach, but they're also associated with CNS, with, with brain disease. Overwhelmingly, what they cause is a loss of developmental milestones. That's how we see the disease. That's the red flag for us that makes us think first about the, about the lysosomal diseases. And, and you can have the lysosomes that destroy either what we call gray matter, that's the neuron, the cell body, or white matter, and that's the insulation, the myelin sheath around the neurons. And, and they get problems in different orders, but the order that you see in the neuron disease is more like the kinds of things that we see in the mitochondrial disease and more like the kind of progression that we see in uh, other energy deficiencies. And again, th this puzzling thing of, you know, they had the genetic lesion from when they were born, why do they show the disease later? So these kids don't, you can't make the diagnosis when they're newborns, but it takes six months to four years before you start seeing disease. What's going on over all that time? Well, we think with the lysosomes that it takes a while for the debris to build up because they can't break down the complicated molecules that the body's making, so the garbage men are on strike. So the things just build up in the cells and then they, they eventually get the better of them and they start having a problem. Again, we can't make the diagnosis any other way than taking a, a biopsy. We take a skin biopsy or we get some blood and we look at cultured blood cells. Um, uh, it, so it takes a biopsy that you don't assay for the gene product, you assay for the function of that compartment. And why these have become very important is that a wave of recent treatments have been available. More embarrassingly, the way they come to, they're all the most expensive diseases to treat. So now they're in the news because of the fact that they cost half a million dollars to treat the kids and all this about the costs of pharmaceuticals. But, but what's really happened is that they've pushed the leading edge of the kinds of medicines we know how to make. And so there have been now, and so, I, so, so I, I, I'm the uh, US uh, primary investigator on a clinical trial of a, of a drug that just got approved by the EU last week for this rare storage disease called uh, Wolman syndrome or LAL deficiency that causes this pervasive lethal disease that now there's sort of a miracle cure for. The miracle cure means they got the human gene, they put it into a chicken cell, they grew a chicken from the chicken cell. The chicken lays eggs. They catch the eggs. They break the eggs. They take the egg white. They purify the gene product from the egg white. Send it to me. I put it into my kid. And then he gets better. And, you know, that's about as fancy as you can get. Okay? But that's why also it costs a fortune. Makes it hard to understand how our worldwide clinical trial found eight kids to treat, who's going to make a medicine for eight kids? So we have this whole problem with orphan diseases. Who's going to treat these rare diseases? And then when you do, how are you going to recoup the costs of all that kind of fancy business that goes on? Yet somebody thinks there's a bottom line there because the company that did the study got bought by a bigger company for billions of dollars. So somehow somebody thinks this is going to lead to lots of other kinds of medicines. So we then, with that background, <laughs> we're going to make the transition into our Center for Autism and Research and Translation. And that's this perspective, that, that, uh, that, I, that I believe we have compelling reasons to think of autism as an illness. Luckily, I don't think we need to think of it as an injury, although there are those who do. The worry was, if there's a critical window in development that you have to sail through normally, and if you don't do it, you don't get another chance. It's all over with, it's all lost. We see that with amblyopia, kids who have lazy eye. If you don't use an eye at a certain time of development, you won't be able to get it back. That's why they patch the good eye to force the kid to use the weaker eye. 
We worried that autism could be like that. Everything we've learned from the animal models tells us that's not true, that you could go all the way to an adult, have the full phenotype, and then you can intervene and reverse that. So I think that holds open the opportunity for it to be a treatable disease, because what are you gonna do if it's not a treatable disease? Then all you can do is try to figure out how to prevent it from happening in the first place a little bit like the heart attack model kind of thing. Some people think it's just important because it's going to tell us how the brain works. We'll learn it's an important model thing. We're going to learn how all these things happen. I don't think we can afford to just do that. The big issue is there probably are here somewhere people who just feel that autism is their identity. That's who they are. How dare anybody want to try to change that? And I understand that. I mean, geneticists have dealt with that for a very long time. And we understand that from the, the little people of America, short stature, or from the deafness communities that, 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 that don't want anything other than that. They don't view that as being a problem. I just think the burdens on the families and on society are too huge for us to wait for the autism population to be a five, billion, $500 billion issue, uh, and all that lost productivity, all those lost kids. I, so I, I just am not willing to say, okay, let's just pass a bunch of laws and let things happen. I think we really do have to do this. And if we're going to take it as an illness, then we have to say that the kinds of things we're going to do is we need to understand the mechanism. We need to be able to find markers of that mechanism that we can target and make interventions. And that's what we're trying to do. And we have to do it because the FDA only has two approved drugs and they only help things like injurious behavior. Uh, they don't target the core features of autism. They just help the kids not hurt themselves. Uh, and it's a huge unmet need. I mean, that, that's just huge. There are a jillion things that families do who have kids with autism. I've never met a family that's not doing some of these. There are only a couple that really scare me. At chelation, every year about three or four kids die who are going to some quack for chelation. Chelation has no role in autism. I'll say that we metabolic geneticists do have diseases that we chelate for, but this is not one. Um, hyperbaric oxygen is enormously expensive, is a waste of time, but you don't, you're not going to hurt somebody. So if you do that, okay. But, but, but the problem is, is why should any of these be helpful? Nobody ever, ever does clinical trials on these things. They just do them and sell them for huge amounts of money, and people who are desperate to, to do anything do these things. And uh, the only one on this list is ABA therapy. The behavioral therapies do help. Starting them early is very important and can be life-saving for the kids. Well, this is what our proposal is. This is what the Center for Autism Research and Translation was built to do. There's this idea where you discover something you think might be a vulnerability, like we're saying this calcium might be a vulnerability. How do we get across what has come to be called the valley of death to get to the point where you're ready to do a clinical trial? And that's been a big stopping point over the many years. And the problem has been being able to move all these steps and that's where we're focused on trying to validate a candidate mechanism, a candidate step, and to develop that preclinically so it's ready to go into a clinical trial. Um, and that was only made possible because of unbelievable uh, insights, uh, bold <laughs> roll of the dice from the Thompson Family Foundation. This is Bill and Nancy. Um, in this room, I don't know how many years ago, I gave a talk. And this gentleman came up to me afterwards and said, you know, I'm really interested in the kind of stuff you do. I said, thank you. And then there's a little lady sitting next to him, and then I talked to her, and she talked to me for a while, and he was standing there. And then, you know, he sat down after a while, and he came back, and he said, you, you don't seem to understand. I'm Bill Thompson. I'm the founder of PIMCO, uh, and it's past CEO, and I'm really interested in talking to you about the things that you're doing. And I said, oh, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> Well, I mean, and, and he was as good as his word, is what I can say. Um, he, 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 uh, it took a long time, uh, but eventually what happened is he put together a consortium that put $28 million together to take us from clinical care all the way to very basic research. 
and we've put together about 50 researchers working together on this. We had our launch event in December of 2012, and we had a big sort of coming out and coming together, trying to build the thing for a year, and now we've been sort of working at this for about a year and a half. And these are all the people, and I apologize, I can't say all their names, but what we've basically done is we've taken six core capabilities that we thought would be critical to really understanding the disease autism. And that goes from genomics, where we're doing whole genome sequencing, uh, to cell signaling, where I'm going to tell you a, a little more about some of the very specific things we've been doing in that. Synapse, that's how the nerves talk to one another. That's largely based on mouse models. There's all the stem cells. That's taking the skin biopsies we take from our patients. We push them into a pluripotent cell that can become any cell in the body. We pull them out as a neuron. Some of those neurons we study in a dish. Some of them we inject into a mouse brain, let them wire into the mouse brain, and then study the mouse brain with the marked human cells in them to see how they're doing what they do. So it's a very, very comprehensive package. This clinical trial's outcome is critical. We don't know what to measure in an autism clinical trial to know if the kids are getting better. The only tool we have is these neurobehavioral tests that are meant to diagnose the disease. So a diagnostic test is not meant to tell you whether they're getting better or worse, but it's being used that way, even though it's not validated for being used in that way. Because we don't have anything else to do. So we're trying to, we're trying to multiplex a number of novel clinical trial outcomes together with these standard behavioral tests to see if we can make a, a more robust package. And, and, and we really have a terrific group of, of, of pharmacologists with three distinct leads, novel molecules that already cure, quote, cure mouse models of the disease. But I told you that curing mouse models isn't a gold standard because the drug companies have walked away, literally walked away from neuropsychiatric drug development because they know the mouse models don't work. They've spent too much money, they've cured too many mice, not enough people, and so they're not working. But, but, but we do at least know that these three novel sets of compounds do cure mice. We want to try to anchor them better. So here's the specifics of what we're doing. We're doing what's called next generation sequencing, where everybody who comes in gets their whole genome sequence. That was crazy. I told you we only knew how to look at chromosomes a little while ago. I go back 10 years, we were doing these arrays. Only about four or five years ago did we start sequencing, and the price has been plummeting. The first genome was several billion dollars. The second was about 200 million. That was Jim Watson was the second one. The third was $50,000, and now we're getting them for $800 a piece. This is mind-boggling. This is uh, that's research. I mean, if you go to a store and try to buy it, it'll be about 5,000. But but the point is, is that it's price to do this enormous amount of data collection is small. We can't even think about the data we're getting so much. We've got some people who are thinking about how they're going to be thinking about it over there, but, but we don't know how to analyze this fast enough, so we're going to be analyzing sets of it, but we'll, at least we'll have all the information in a jar somewhere that we can go back out. We have all this very, very sophisticated functional microscopy. I'm going to be showing you more of that in a little bit. This is one example. This is a super resolution microscope. This is the thing that the Nobel Prize was awarded for last year in chemistry. Uh, this plays a central role in figuring out uh, the signaling process that we were looking at. It allows you to look at the cells that are alive at, remarkably, a resolution beyond the diffraction limit of light. So it's, it's very fancy. And we're lucky to have Ian Parker, who's a super guru at this whole thing, who's working with us on this. Um, the synapse stuff is looking at how the nerves talk to one another in animal models, mouse brains. I told you the stem cells were able to take the skin cells, push them out, turn them into neurons, take those neurons, inject them into the mice brains. And this is the whole panoply of things that we get when the kids come in the door. So they're here with us for a whole day. We keep them very busy. We do a bunch of behavioral assessments. We get them set up to do sleep studies at home. We do these very fancy high-density EEGs. We're developing, we're not yet using a MEG, it's a very fancy machine that we have a very smart physicist. He, it's, it's a magnetic-based assay of brain function. He figured out a way, this is the kind of thing that CART does. He was a physicist who was tracking submarines underwater with, with magnetic waves, and we put him together with uh, one of our EEG specialists, 
and decided that he could find the same waves in the kid's brain. So it's a machine that he's able to build for $100,000 that's now a $10 million machine. So we think that this is going to be real important. So it's just, it, you bring together groups of people and synergies can, can happen. We're getting a bunch of metabolites. We're teaching them how to use things on the iPad. This is that optogenics. I cannot explain it to you, but it's a miraculous thing where we can put a, we can engineer into the human cells a little ion channel, put a gene in, and now when we shine a light on the brain of the mouse, we will turn on or off a pathway in the brain. So we can do his job, then flick the light switch on, that pathway off, turn the light switch on, turns it the other way. So we can very specifically assay the function of different pathways and models that are involved in the disease. And these are the three different lead compounds, and I can't go through what they are. So, so, so here's where we are in autism. Now I'm going to be departing from what the world all sort of believes. And that's that we have these clusters of genes. I said, well, we find lots and lots of genes, but they aren't in random places. So if you look at what genes touch, and touch, it's not touching on the chromosome, but interacting with one another, what many groups annotate, say that those genes are doing is that they're playing a role in how the nerve cells talk to one another. When we look at that information, we say, no, what they're really doing is they're looking at mechanisms by which calcium signals inside of cells. And so the problem is we get this kind of interaction, interact home, whatever you want to call it, but you can't do anything with it because there's too many genes there. It won't be a diagnostic signal. Everybody's not going to have all of them hit. What are you going to do with it? Well, it just tells you what the architecture, this is a new term, we're talking about the architecture of the disease. How would you make this disease happen? Well, this is one way you could make this disease happen. You then take those genes and you turn them into proteins and you put them where they belong in the cell. What are they doing? Well, there's a lot of guys that are up here on the cell membrane and there are some guys that are down here in these intracellular compartments. I wonder what they're all doing. And you blow it up and you start getting a mechanism that looks a little like this. And this is the kind of a system we wanted to find a way to look at. And that's where this fancy microscopy comes into play because this microscopy can watch calcium flow because we have these molecular sensors that respond very quickly to changes in the calcium concentration. And I will show it to you in a second. But if a single molecule, and all these are very simple machines, all that they do is they're dancing back and forth in the membrane and they open sometimes and then they close, open and close. That's all that they're doing. They're not, they're not changing anything. It's a very ephemeral, very hard to see signal. And so sometimes this thing dances open and lets a little calcium leak out of the endoplasmic reticulum, that third organelle that I mentioned to you. What turns out is if that calcium comes out and if, it, if, it, if, if enough of it comes out to tickle its next door neighbors, well, they all are very sensitive to calcium. So if a little calcium touches them, they'll pop open too. So they'll pop open. And what can wind up if you get an exuberant enough response is that this little puff that happens in this little local cluster will tickle its next door neighbor. And what you'll wind up with is what we call a saltatory wave that spreads through the cell as a big, the scale changes in all of these waves, as a very different event. This event is happening stochastically, and you can see it's like a quantum, whereas these are much larger groups of cells responding. This is a picture of what these little events, they're all over the place on the cell. There's all these little active areas in the cell, and this is beautiful to watch. This is, this is what we call single channel activity. These are these probabilistic stochastic activations of this membrane pore. And you'll notice when it opens, it opens. It's a quantum. It's a certain amount. It's not just any old amount. It's a certain amount. And again, it's just so beautiful to see. I mean, so here, here's one guy opening. Here's two guys opening. Three, four. So it's, it's a quantal behavior that you're looking at. It's a molecule that you're able to watch dancing back and forth between two different shapes. Who cares? Well, here's who cares. <laughs> um, this is what these things look like. Okay, can you make it dance? There it is. Okay, so it's dancing here now. So th these, so what, okay, now the it's activated. Now, do you see the little lightning burst? Boom, 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 boom. 
That's the message. That is the message. So who cares what that is? Well, okay, so, that, so, so what, what you are watching are those single molecules opening and closing, letting a burst of calcium out of the endoplasmic reticulum. Well, what happens is that we looked at three different single gene mutations that cause an autism phenotype. Number, a number of independent people with these different genetic lesions. They're in completely different genes. They work in completely different machines. And what we can see is that those single molecule events are changed, even though the cells do not have a mutation that changes that molecule. So the molecule is downstream integrating all of these other signals. So what's happening here? All of those little signals are the same in the control and in the mutants. They all open after the same amount of time. They're just exactly the same. But they pop open, and in the mutants, they snap closed right away. They don't, they don't stay open very long. They shut very fast. They flicker. They have less than half the open time duration as the controls do. And, and so this looks like something that we can see now in the whole wave in the cell so that if we look at the depolarization spreading in the cell, we can see that it's qualitatively different in those mutants that I told you about. And we can even gear it up to look at it in a high throughput screening machine, a machine that you could put hundreds of cells through a day, looking at hundreds or thousands in companies that can look at tens of thousands of compounds a day to see if they change the assay. So here's what the assay looks like in the control cells. It's a very robust calcium signal, but it's damped, dramatically damped in the mutant. This is fragile X. And if we look at something that liberates all the calcium in the cells, they all look exactly the same. So it's a very specific trigger that's been damaged in these cells. And it's the same kind of damage we see in fragile X and in tuberous sclerosis. And in fact, in a whole host of the monogenic causes of autism, but also now, and this is all preliminary and unpublished, um, in a number of autism walk-in-the-door subjects who have been enrolled through CARP. So they're, they're showing this dramatic reduction in this calcium signal, and we don't know how they do that. We, we don't know what it is. We know that it's not a mutation in that protein, and it's telling us something about what we want to tickle. If we could tickle that and boost these guys up, that would be terrific. We think that would be helpful. And that's where I'm going to end, and I'll take your questions. So we think we're making headway over a year and a half towards some direction, towards discovery and finding a rag to functionalize what's going on in autism and to hopefully bring something to bear that'll bend the curve in the increasing rate of this disorder. So I want to thank um, my collaborators in the research project I just talked to you about. The paper just appeared two days ago or three days ago in Translational Psychiatry. We have 50 terrific faculty members that are all working together in a number of the schools at UCI, all collaborating. A number of the members in the clinical center, certainly the Thompson Family Foundation for having the hope that we could do something, and for prior funding we got from the NIH, from Autism Speaks, and from Doris Duke Foundation. Thank you very much.